Check, check. There we are. That's the sound of my voice with a cold. <laughs> well, my name is Tim. I serve as one of the as one of the the, the, the pa, pa, pastors here, and I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, this is great to see the amount of people that have come to hear and to learn and to grow. Uh, if you're visiting from another family of faith, we just want to say that you are welcome here, and I'm glad that you have joined us. Or maybe you're here and you're exploring faith. And maybe one of the questions you've had is, how can I believe in a good God when I read these, what to me are awful accounts in the Old Testament? And so that's been part of kind of the, those barriers to faith. And so if that's you here, I'm, I'm glad that you're here as well. And maybe you're from our church and you've heard about this and you are here to learn and grow. And we're glad you're here as well. This morning we had a chance, the book club that our church is doing is Flood and Fury, which is Matt Lynch's, it's his, his newest book. And so our book club this morning got the chance to sit around for about two hours and pepper him with questions. Uh, and it was great uh, just, to, just to hear and learn and grow. And so we have a book club once or twice a year here uh, where they engage at a, le a level that is meant to help the mature Christian grow in their faith and to wrestle with some of those deeper que questions. And so that was a privilege this morning. Matt Lynch, he's Dr. Matthew Lynch, but I asked him, he said, Matt Lynch is fine. Matt Lynch uh, is the Associate Professor of Old, Old Testament at, at, Re, at Re, Regent, which is a, which is a, 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 a seminary and co college uh, that I have great affinity and love for. Um, they do great work and put out some great uh, materials, and so I would encourage you to check them out if you are considering po post-secondary. And uh, I'm just going to invite him up, and, and then I'm going to pray, and then we'll see where this evening goes. If you're new here, our bathrooms are straight out these two back doors on the right-hand side. That's where the bathrooms are. You can get up at any point to grab a coffee, a tea. That's all located back into your left um, also as well, once he's done his talk, which will be about 45 minutes, so that will land us somewhere at 8, uh, we're going to take a 20-minute break. Um, and so that will be a chance for you to use the bathrooms, grab a coffee. We had a woman's Christmas brunch here this morning, and the leftover desserts are spectacular. Uh, so we are going to uh, have some phenomenal uh, some desserts uh, in the, the connection break, no thanks to me. Uh, and then uh, we'll come back for a question and response. I like to say Q and R. It's not Q and A. There's not always an answer, uh, but question and, and, and response. And there will be a text. Uh, there will be a number on the screen, and you'll text in your question, and then I will vet those, and we'll go through those. And so that's how that will work. Um, as a church, we want to be a church where we're not afraid to ask hard questions, where we're not afraid to look at some of those pieces of faith that sometimes trouble us a bit. I think it's important that we do that because uh, if we really believe that God is a God of truth, then it's okay to ask hard questions. It's okay to think about things that tr uh, tr 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 trouble us. It's okay to r r r wrestle with the things that are messy. And so we want to be a church where we can do that as we follow Christ. So I'm going to pray for Matt, and then I'm looking forward to what you have to say. God, I pray for Matt. God, I thank you for the years of study and thought that he has put into your word. I thank you for the countless uh, hours that he has poured into learning original languages and to writing, to, to also teaching about your word. God, I pray tonight, uh, wherever we're coming from, maybe we're just exploring faith and we got questions, or maybe we've known you for a while and we want to think more about your word. I pray that you would meet us wherever we are. Give him your guidance through your Holy Spirit as he speaks now. In your name, amen. amen. Welcome him with me, please. Thanks, Tim. Uh, welcome, everyone. Really good to be with all of you this evening. Uh, I want to just say thanks to Doug and, and uh, Don and, and Tim as well for the invitation to River West Church here. That's a real privilege to come out. So I'm based in Vancouver, and so it's my first time in Edmonton. So. And thanks to all of you who, who managed to come out in this evening and for the leftover food as well. It's fantastic. So a friend uh, of mine recently sent me this cartoon, and you probably can't read all the, 
the wording there because it's a little bit, a little bit small print. Um, but it's about poetry and how we interpret them, how we interpret poems. And, and I wanted to uh, reflect on this cartoon just briefly here at the beginning. I wanted to share it with you. Uh, because it gets at something that I think connects to the way that we also read uh, biblical texts more generally. Just a quick question on the audio. I'm hearing like a ring. Is it? Okay. Okay. So one of the things that uh, in one of the frames here, I don't agree with every frame exactly, but one of the frames captures something really important. In the second frame, it says, if you criticize a poem... It will not change its ways, uh, which I really like that idea, that there's a resistance in poems if you try to just interpret them, that they might resist our efforts to sort of just extract meaning from them. And I like the fourth frame as well. If you dissect a poem, be prepared for what you might find inside. And, and these sentiments illustrate a sort of parallel disconnect that I experience sometimes around the study of violence in the Old Testament. We analyze biblical stories and poems and, and often want them to become something other than what they are. We want them maybe to be a little nicer or more domesticated or to be a little clearer. Um, I could say that for a lot of the Bible. But they are what they are. They are themselves. So my hang-up isn't necessarily, when it comes to the question of thinking about violence in the Bible, my problem isn't necessarily with the concern to address ethical issues or dilemmas that we read in Scripture, but my concern sometimes is the way that our efforts, that our efforts to interpret and make sense of violence in the Bible can unwittingly distort the very text that we're trying to understand. So I don't want to sound dismissive of hard questions at all. In fact, I really welcome those and think they're important. But because I take our questions about violence really seriously, I want to understand the variegated terrain within which um, we hope to find answers. So part of that involves a return to ask questions like, what kind of biblical texts do we find these violent texts in? So for the rest of my time in this talk, I want to give you a sort of sampling of that terrain uh, to help frame our questions about violence with a view to finding a richer and hopefully more nuanced uh, approach to the challenge of reading violent texts in the Bible as Christians. So how does the Old Testament think about the problem of violence? So to to kind of think about that train, I want to step back for a moment and, and talk about an earlier book I wrote, which is called Portraying Violence in the Hebrew Bible, um, which has a nice picture of Cain and Abel on the front. Um, so in that book, I, I asked the question, how do biblical writers themselves think about the problem of violence? In other words, on those occasions where they consider violence a problem, what's the big deal with violence? So it might sound like a question with an obvious answer, like violence harms and it hurts or it's just wrong. But there's much more we can say about the, uh, what the biblical writers believe about what falls into the category of violence. So I, in that book, I focused on four different grammars, like ways of talking about violence as a problem um, and, and sort of the patterns of representation of those problems that we see in Scripture. So let me, let me just go through those real quick. The first one is violence is a, an ecological or an ecocidal phenomena. In other words, violence disrupts and destroys the physical world. Creation. Human-on-human -human violence also ruins the land. This is one area that biblical writers would be absolutely horrified with our violence. And I think that's important to note in the discussion. This morning when we were, we were talking about um, violence, um, I, I said that if we were there in a book study, and if the biblical authors had a book study, I think one of the things they would want to study is the problem of modern ecological violence. Um, that that would be a, a conundrum that they would 
you know, rack their brains to think about, just like we think about violence in the Bible. So Cain killed Abel, and in response, the ground got involved, refusing to yield crops to Cain. Uh, consider Hosea 4, 1 to 3 as, as another example. So in this, the prophet Hosea says, There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing, lying, and murder, stealing, and adultery. They break all bounds. And bloodshed follows bloodshed. Because of this, the land dries up, and all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, and the fish and the sea are swept away. So for Hosea, there's a kind of causal connection between violence that appears in the human realm and the state of the land itself. It's like the land and the animals all go into mourning in response to what humans are doing. Uh, the second one is violence takes the form of immoral speech. So the focus here is on the way that speech plays a major role in biblical ways of thinking about violence. It's the, it's the enemy who's secretly scheming and publicly boasting and reproaches that consistently preoccupy biblical writers when talking about violent acts of the enemy, especially in Psalms and Proverbs. As you read those books, you'll notice how often the, the psalmist or the, the sage is talking about the fear that they have because an enemy is speaking about them. So I wanted to know why. I wanted to think about this. And as I, I studied the question, I concluded that biblical writers center what they consider the most socially destructive element of violence, and that is speech. So deceptive and violent speech was at the root of many social ills because communities depend on righteous and reliable speech for their very survival. So Psalm 64 kind of provides an example of this kind of violence. Hear me, my God, protect my life from the threat of the enemy. Hide me from the conspiracy of the wicked. They sharpen their tongues like swords and aim cruel words like deadly arrows. They shoot from ambush at the innocent. They shoot suddenly without fear, but God will shoot them with his arrows. They will suddenly be struck down. He will turn their own tongues against them and bring them all to ruin. And all who see them will shake their heads in scorn. So you can see there the foregrounding of speech as the major problem. We see this in a number of Psalms um, throughout scripture. The third one is uh, judicial, um, the way that violence creates a judicial crisis. Um, I don't have a particular example text here, but this one is so pervasive. So according to many legal texts in the Bible, think about like Exodus or Deuteronomy and other places, violent acts elicit an outcry. And that outcry was like a signal or an alarm that something was fundamentally wrong. And that's, that signaled, all, it also functioned as a call for those who have power, social power, judicial power, to fulfill their duty on behalf of the victim. In fact, the most foundational story in the whole Old Testament is the Exodus story. And that story kicks off with a cry that goes up from the Hebrew slaves, and it says in Exodus 2 that it rises up to God, and God hears it, and he looks, and he sees the people, and he comes down. And that then begins God's involvement in the story. So it's like it, it, all, it all begins with that initial outcry, from the Hebrew slaves, and then the story, the rest is history. So outcries are like alarms. Um, so uh, signaling to both uh, those with power um, and to God himself. So the redeemer had to redeem, the judge had to ask, uh, judge justly, the victim's family or God had to exact proportionate judgment, and so on. So these also, um, these outcries also um, highlighted the fact that society had ignored the cries of the most vulnerable members. So in, in this way of framing things, violence is often represented um, as an, in terms of the outcry it elicited and put certain social judicial problems um, into the center of our kind of frame. 
The next one that I highlighted was in, uh, the way that violence causes impurity. This is another one that I, I realize is, is sort of different from maybe the way that we are used to thinking about violence and what's so bad about it, right? So violence leaves a stain or a residue that can't be addressed um, ritually, um, and even after the judicial problems had been addressed in court, there's still something left over, a residue that needs dealing with. There's something more that has to be handled after the courthouse closes its doors. So we might call this the spiritual residue of bloodshed. So an analogy here would be um, uh, hands on the, on the uh, blood on the hands of uh, soldiers who participate in war um, and so on. Um, so biblical writers recognize that something left over. Uh, so uh, just a couple examples here of the way this pollution is described. Uh, you must not pollute the land where you live, for blood defiles the land. And the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed there, except by the blood of the person who shed it. Uh, in another text, Psalm 106, we read about the, this is a historical psalm, kind of giving a summary of Israel's uh, life and their, their failings. And it says, they shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was desecrated by their blood. And so, uh, by various means, these things needed addressing. So these, uh, these four grammars are an important part of the conversation about violence in the Bible, just to have them there. Um, and they remind us um, that the problem of violence, from a biblical point of view, isn't just something that we have to deal with in Scripture. Um, the Bible can be read in a way that spotlights and highlights our violence as well, even things that we might not sort of put in the category of violence initially. So perhaps we need to grapple with the eco ecological impact of our violence, or perhaps we need to consider the ways that violence leaves something, uh, some kind of residue that needs dealing with, an impurity that persists, um, or the way that speech can connote violence. So these are questions put to us uh, via a sort of ground-up approach. So one of the things I, when I think about these two books, the first one is a ground-up study of how does the Bible itself think about and represent violence? Um, what are its perspectives and questions that it might ask us? Um, but then I, I realize we also have those top-down questions. In other words, like our questions about things in the Bible that we feel are violent, right? So what do we do with those things? So after writing Portraying Violence, I wanted to return to the question of what to do with texts like Joshua or the flood story and so on, and so um, things that we consider violent. So in uh, Flood and Fury, in the first chapter, I look at, at eight common approaches. Oh, so yeah, yeah, there we go. Back to the dog. Um, how do we, how might we think about the Bible's violence? So I'm not going to walk through all eight of these, um, but I, I lay out, and I'm drawing from Roger uh, Olson here, who yeah, I'm modifying his taxonomy. Um, but I look at eight common approaches to the problem of violence in the Old Testament, considering their strengths and, and weaknesses. And, and part of the point of laying these out is, is at the beginning of the book is for readers to think about like, well, how would, I, how would I sort of approach this problem or where do I sit right now? And maybe it would be a combination of these various approaches. And I try to highlight their strengths and potential weaknesses as well. Uh, and also I'm trying to argue against our ability to find one key that just unlocks the problem of violence. And I think for a lot of us, that's maybe what we're looking for. Like you've, you've maybe struggled with violent texts in scripture and portrayals of God in the Old Testament. And it's like, if we just had this sort of one way of looking at it that made all of that stuff go away um, or reframed it entirely in peaceful terms or something like that, that would relieve the tension that we feel as we sometimes approach scripture. Um, and, and I actually think we should resist that. Um, and, and instead of the sort of single solution approach 
we need a more sort of field adaptive flexibility uh, to be able to grapple with the range of scripture texts that we have uh, and also the way that approaches that Christians and Jewish people as well have embraced historically can be helpful in varying degrees um, depending on which text we're looking at. So there's a kind of model defying quality to what I'm doing in the book, but um, if I, uh, to go back to that, that slide there, um, I modified the, the comic there. So if you try to fit the Bible into, uh, violent text in the Bible into one mo model, they may elude you completely, right? They're gonna be resistant to that. So, but if I had an approach that I take in the book, it would be something along the lines of read the text carefully and prepare to be surprised, right? So it's not really a, a model for solving it, but it's, it's a call to just attend carefully to the biblical text. And this type of exegetical approach, um, as the, uh, uh, one of my uh, professors from Regent, Eugene Peterson said, that careful approach to scripture, it's not pedantry, it's an act of love. It's about loving God enough to slow down and get the words right. It's a sustained act of humility, that listening closely and carefully, to hear the text in its own terms. And we need to assure, um, ensure that our own questions don't actually overwhelm the text such that we muffle its own voice. So to hear the text in its own terms, um, we have to make sure that those questions don't cause us to sort of misdiagnose and therefore mistreat the problem. So giving someone CPR when they need the Heimlich isn't the best uh, thing to do. And so I think sometimes um, in, a, uh, in wrestling with violence, violent texts, we do like a quick read of the Bible and then we go to solve it. And I think sometimes we've misdiagnosed the Bible and it's equivalent to you know, giving CPR there. Um, so I want to give a, a few examples of, of ways that I did this in the book. Um, tomorrow morning I'm preaching on the flood story, so you'll get some of elements of this tomorrow uh, as well, but uh, in more detail or different, differently put. Um, but to, to give some of that here, the two stories that I take in the book to dive into and to analyze more closely are the flood story in Genesis 6 through 9 and the book of Joshua, the conquest stories. That's the flood and the fury. So there's a, a popular representation of the flood story, and it kind of it goes like this. Things got bad, God got mad, and God ruined everything. Uh, and we have, the, we have this illustrated here. You can see from these firsthand photos um, that it didn't go too well for most people, and, and certainly not for the animals as well. Now, uh, this is from the Brick Testament, by the way, which uh, t uses Lego to portray stories in the Bible, often very graphically, um, if you can imagine that, with Lego. So the, the only problem with this formulation, uh, I want to suggest, is that numbers two and three are, are wrong. Uh, God got mad and God ruined everything, at least mostly wrong. So first, to go to the um, God got mad one, number two, the only divine demo, uh, emotion on display in the flood story uh, is divine grief. As Genesis 6, 6 says, and the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth and it pained him to his heart. The idea that divine grief underpins the story is surprising, especially given the divine resolve to ruin the earth in Genesis 6, 13. And, and I'll come back to that statement in a moment. So um, I should say, just as a sort of caveat, um, that, and, and this is a point at which a lot of people will, will differ, and that's fine, um, that it, to me, it seems clear that Genesis is engaging a world where flood stories were a cultural given. We see this in the Epic of Gilgamesh and Atrahasis and other stories as well. They were, they were floating around already uh, from as early as 2700 uh, BC. 
Uh, this is, that's at least, um, oh, you know, a, a good 1,500 years before any Hebrew was even developed, and that's even like the, the most pr uh, primitive Hebrew. Uh, so this is near the beginning of writing itself. Humans have been telling flood stories. Uh, the oldest one is the Sumerian king list, uh, dating back that old Eridu Genesis, and as I mentioned, Atrahasis and Gilgamesh. These other flood stories likely reflect uh, their environment. Um, the shared memories of localized cataclysmic events, like the periodic flooding of the Tigris and Euphrates river basin, that storytellers drew from when speaking about the watery beginnings of civilization. So the map here uh, shows the way that floods could sweep down from the Taurus Mountains of southeast Turkey and flood Mesopotamia, uh, its, its sort of marshy areas. And Israel participates in this world by drawing from these older flood stories, their basic structure, and engaging them critically and creatively, um, asking us to look at an already known story this way. For instance, Yahweh is the only God in the Genesis flood story. So in the ancient Near Eastern stories, there's a divine antagonist and there's a divine protagonist, one who sends the flood and the other who helps the hero by telling them that hero to build an ark, to get animals in it, and so on. But in a monotheistic story where there's only one God, we find another antagonist in the biblical story. Okay, so just to um, yeah, back up for a moment, what I'm, what I'm saying is that um, there's a, a sort of known phenomenon of flood stories, cultural flood stories that Israel is retelling. Um, so the, the antagonist, though, in the biblical story is not another God, because Israel is monotheistic, there's one God. But the antagonist here is violence. So notice uh, Genesis 6, uh, 11 to 13. Now the earth was ruined in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw the earth and behold, it was ruined. For all the people on earth had ruined their ways. So God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence because of them. For I am about to ruin both them and the earth. So first of all, notice that in verses 11 and 12, that's, um, yeah, you can see both those there. Um, the earth is already ruined prior to the flood. And it's because violence had filled the earth and, and human corruption. So if we think back to, to Cain murdering Abel, um, this shouldn't be too surprising. Because in that case, when Cain killed his brother, the land responded by refusing to put forth its produce for Cain. In other words, there was like a hardening effect on the land because blood had been shed upon it. And what Genesis 6 wants to say is that that phenomenon happened at a macro level such that creation itself became uninhabitable. The earth was ruined. One murder brought about that crop failure and how much more a world full of bloodshed. And notice how verse 12 inverts Genesis 1.31, where we read, God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good. And then Genesis 6, um, uh, 13, or 12 says, God saw the earth and behold, it was ruined. It's like the writer wants to kind of evoke the memory of Genesis 1 and say, everything now has been flipped upside down. So the good creation God made have been subverted and ruined. So the antagonist in this flood story is violence, not a rival deity. God is looking at an already ruined creation. To adapt Martin Luther's phrase, creation was curved in on itself. It's the way he talks about the human condition and sin. So what then of that pesky statement at the end of verse 13, just to go back there for a moment, um, where it says, behold, I, in other words, God is about to ruin both them and the earth. And verse 17 highlights that same idea as well. So one of the things I, I argue in the book is that the kind of ruining God does is qualitatively different from the kind of ruin brought about by violence. So violence ruined a good creation, contrary to God's purposes, um, as seen on, on this slide 
like here with the text. Uh, by contrast, by sending a flood, Yahweh facilitates the possibility of renewal. So like a potter who looks at the wheel and sees that the clay is full of air bubbles, holes, and thinned out walls. With the sides of the clay formation peeling away and flapping about on the wheel, God returns creation back to a ball, so to speak, useful formlessness. So, in other words, God's ruin returns creation back to its Genesis 1, verse 2 state in order to remake it. Okay, so it's, uh, if you use that potter wheel analogy, and I'll touch on this tomorrow too, but um, the, the clay is, if you've ever spun clay on a wheel, you know that um, if it has air bubbles and it's, and it's got holes in the clay and it's falling apart, you can't just patch it and then fire it in a kiln. It will explode. Um, so what you have to do is take the ruined formation and return it to a ball. And I think that's what the ruining is that God is doing in, one th in uh, 6.13. So uh, Genesis 8 makes um, this precise point. Notice how it evokes Genesis 1 verse 2 to tell us that God was returning things back to their original state or their pre-creation state. So in God, I'm going to read uh, Genesis um, 1, 2 here first. Now the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind or spirit from God swept over the face of the water. So I highlight here all the Hebrew words that are used in Genesis 8 then. So you can see the connection between the two. Genesis 8, 1 and 2 says, And God made a wind spirit blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rains from the heaven were restrained. So the clear recall of Genesis 1, 2 suggests that the purpose of the flood was to facilitate the return of creation to its pre-creation not yet, but about to be state. So from the perspective of this really uh, evocative story, violence ruined creation. So the divine potter takes the clay that's ruined, returns it to a ball, and begins to reform it with the same spirit by which he hovered over the waters and breathed forth those words, let there be light. So while that doesn't resolve all the difficulties in the Genesis text, it puts the matter of violence in a, hopefully a different light. Um, here, violence is the antagonist in a parable-like story about the fundamental problems threatening the good creation that God made. All right, let's, look, let's move on to uh, the fury, Joshua. What of the book of Joshua? So Josh, Joshua, this is something that, that kind of... Uh, I had to come to after a while, is, is an unsuspecting literary genius. So on the surface, the book can feel a little bit flat, like Joshua lacks character depth. We get almost nothing by way of interior dialogue. He's not as complex as someone like David or Moses. Um, he doesn't really have any faults or failings, so a little hard to relate to in that way. Um, hardly any emotional complexity, and he can feel like a 2D character. So this might add to the feeling that the conquest story told in the book of Joshua was a rather heartless endeavor. God commanded the destruction of the Canaanites back in Deuteronomy 7, and so Israel did it, and we're all left to deal with it, right? So Israel went in and wiped out men, women, children, and animals, by the way, without mercy, mind you. But here's where I want to go back to the text and look again. So remember, part of my approach, if we can call it that, is to read the text slowly and carefully and prepare to be surprised. Uh, expect the unexpected. So let me, uh, I'll just touch on a couple of things that surprised me as I went through the book of Joshua, and there are, are many. So first, it's worth noting where the book itself begins. That's always a good clue to reading a biblical text, is like, how is the story set up? And where is the narrator drawing our attention? It's like, it's like in a movie. Where is the camera focusing? You know, like the, the knife on the table or something like that. Like obviously kind of drawing our attention there. Where is the camera focusing? 
Um, so the, the book of Joshua, I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, before any military engagements take place, we get five chapters of other stuff in the book. So if, if conquest is the point of the story, it takes a while, a lot of throat clearing to get there, uh, which we should pay attention to. Um, you can see from, from this slide here that in terms of proportionality, the, um, how the, the book is about far more than, than battle accounts. Okay, uh, it, there's a lot more than just uh, battles and war in the book. Military reports make uh, up only 17 to 21 percent of the book, um, if you're being generous. Okay, so that's the orange stuff there, or the actual battle accounts in the book. So uh, just to jump to the punchline, then I'll back up. The reader expects preparation from war, but they get something else instead at the beginning of the book. Um, as one of my students put it in class, as you read Joshua 1 to 5, it's clear that this is a religious feat and not a military feat that we're reading here. Um, so here's, here's how it sort of breaks down in each chapter. So in, in chapter 1, Joshua is rallying the people for the conquest. So there is an extent to which this is preparation for, for war, but it's a very curious sort. He tells them twice that they're their preparation and their success depends on, of all things, Torah meditation. Meditate on the word. Meditate on the law. Day and night. Therein lies your success. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. What a thing to tell people preparing for battle. Right? You're about to face an enemy. You know what you should do? You should study the book of Deuteronomy tonight. Right? Meditate on it, mull over it, contemplate it. All right, so, um, so that's how chapter one, what well, chapter one emphasized. Chapter two, the first reconnaissance mission that Israel goes on is to the house of a prostitute. Again, what a military strategy. And the writer has, has real fun with the reader here. The people, um, when, they, when they send the spies, they're encamped at a place called Shittim. And Shittim is where Israel, in the book of Numbers, had, quote-unquote, played the harlot, according to Numbers, with non-Israelite women and fallen into idolatry. So they go from the place where the memory of spiritual idolatry and, and harlotry are remembered, and they go to the house of a prostitute. Um, so the, the story is told in a way to put up red flags all over the place as we're hearing this. But guess what? She turns out to be the most Yahweh-revering character in the book. And she becomes part of Israel. So here we have the inclusion of the Canaanites in chapter 2. So chapter 1 tells us to meditate on the Torah. Now the Torah says... You are to show them no mercy. Wipe them out entirely. The second chapter then presents you with someone that Israel does not wipe, that, wipe out and they're commended for it. So meditation on the Torah tells us that the law that on the surface might seem black and white is something that requires deep thought and, and care in how we read it, how we interpret it, and how we implement it. Uh, chapters 3 and 4, um, the, the camera slows way down. It takes Israel forever to get across the Jordan. Um, and, and it highlights the Ark's progression, the Ark of the Covenant's progression across the Jordan. And the people's obligation to tell future generations how just like the Red Sea crossing, uh, in the flood story for that matter, God once again dried up the waters and let his people cross the Jordan. So here we have another Torah ideal on display, namely the need to tell what you've seen to future generations. So we have that intergenerational transmission of Yahweh's mighty deeds and the centrality of worship in that story. Uh, Joshua 5, after hearing about uh, the fact that the nations are in tumult uh, upon hearing that Israel is coming into the land, the people... Um, are on the western side of the Jordan, opposite Jericho, 
Uh, so they've now crossed the Jericho. Um, and God tells the people to get swords ready. Flint swords, specifically. And at this point, the reader expects to see some, some dead Canaanites. Um, but instead, God tells them they need to take those swords. And remember, they're in enemy territory at this point. They've crossed the Jordan. And they should circumcise every male in the, in the camp. So, first of all, uh, ouch. Uh, second of all, this is a, a terrible military strategy. So, if you've read Genesis 34, you might remember in that story that um, uh, uh, two of Jacob's sons tricked the, the Shechemites, who had uh, raped their sister, into circumcising everyone in the city. And it says, while they were still sore, Simeon and Levi went in and wiped them all out. In other words, it puts you in a vulnerable place, um, not ready for battle at all. Um, and the question is raised here at this point, why are the Israelites uncircumcised? Because that is the mark of the covenant according to Genesis 17. And without it, anyone was to be cut off. So um, that is, again, not great military strategy. Then they hold a huge Passover celebration, again, in enemy territory. And the, and the chapter itself ends with this mysterious encounter between Joshua and this angel of the Lord who comes and tells Joshua he's neither on their side nor on the Canaanite side, but um, he comes as a representative of the Lord. So we have in this story, um, oh, there's the Passover and then the, um, uh, the angel of the Lord who's there with drawn sword. Um, so in this story, we, we have a number of ways that um, communicated to us that preparation for this battle is of a very different sort. And it's supposed to, I think, clue us into the, a book doing something very different than we might expect. So in this chapter alone, we have, in, uh, sorry, in the first five chapters, we have themes like weakness, the weakness of circumcision, Passover worship, um, the outsider being included in Israel, Torah meditation, and so on. Now, these things don't erase the book's military qualities, but hopefully it puts the book's own aims into focus. So Israel's power was to be found in its embrace of Torah, so much so that at the end of the book, Joshua even says, you did not do this with your sword and bow, uh, but it was by God's power. There are other surprises as well. Let, let me just mention one from the end of the book of Joshua. During his farewell sermon, um, Joshua springs a surprising accusation on Israel. He says to them, put away the foreign gods that are among you. This is an astonishing claim. According to Deuteronomy, Israel was to destroy the Canaanites because of the threat of idolatry. But the problem wasn't just out there, it was interior to them. It was in the Israelite community. We could also note Joshua twenty-two seventeen, which says, Have we not had enough of the sin of Peor, where Israel had fallen into idolatry in the desert, from which even yet we have not cleansed ourselves? and for which a plague came upon the congregation of the Lord. So they had to deal with the problem of idolatry that plagued their own community. So the book is framed at the beginning and the end, so I've that um, thing at the top there, by um, a people who are both uncircumcised and idolatrous and need to become people of the covenant. So in, in these ways, the book is messing with our insider-outsider categories. You see that? Like, it's, it's taking us through these things one by one and, and complicating our picture of the bad guys over there and the good guys here. And the good guys are going to get the land, and the bad guys are going to need to uh, be destroyed. So um, a couple other points I just want to raise here. Um, First of all, Joshua also portrays most of Israel's battles in defensive terms. This might be a bit of a surprise to us. Chapters 10 and 11 are, are where we really have like the, the battle reports given in rapid succession. There are two main campaigns, one in the north, one in the south. In both instances, it's the Canaanite nations that initiate hostilities. So in the southern campaign, a coalition of kings gathered together 
to attack the Gibeonites. So these are another, so there's Canaanites who are called Gibeonites. Um, and a southern campaign gathers together to attack the Gibeonites because they had affiliated with Israel. So there's another group that gets included in Israel. And so Israel, in defense of their covenant partner, the, the Canaanite Gibeonites, um, they uh, go to battle and defend them. And then hearing of the Israelites' victory over the southern kings, a northern coalition gathers and attacks with very many horses and chariots, we're told, uh, which is this ancient equivalent of weapons of mass destruction, chariots and, and horses. So we even hear uh, Joshua say in Joshua 24, 11, reflecting back on Israel's story, that the citizens of Jericho, going back to that first battle, attacked Israel like the other nations, uh, like the other inhabitants of the land, which kind of makes you look back at the Jericho story and think, oh, maybe there's more that we didn't hear about. And if that's correct, then the book contends that with the exception of the battle of Ai in, um, in Joshua 8, Israel's wars were almost exclusively defensive in the book of Joshua. As nations respond to God's activity with Israel, they either respond with affiliation, as in the case of Rahab, the Gibeonites, and others we hear about in the book, um, or hostility, as in the case with the Canaanite and Amorite kings that attack Israel in chapters 10 and 11. Um, and, oh yeah, sorry, and on this, I'll keep it here for a moment. Um, second, uh, considering the historical context of the conquest proved uh, really helpful to me as I was researching for this book. Uh, readers of Joshua would be forgiven for missing the fact that during the time Israel is said to have gone into the land of Canaan, the land was to a large measure still controlled by uh, the Egyptians through a network of city-states. Usually uh, who, um, the, the city-states that they ran their um, authority through, you know, exercise their authority through, were usually walled cities, these large walled cities. So Egypt wanted a buffer region um, between them and the Hittites to the, to the north. Um, so backing these Egyptian-leaning Canaanite rulers and military with military and financial support was effective. Israel was also living with the memory of a, of a people group called the Hyksos, who were Canaanites, who had overrun and even ruled Egypt for several hundred years. Actually, it's more like 150 years. So uh, a look at the history of Egypt's 12th century campaigns in, in Canaan. Now, you can't see all the detail here, but there were at least three campaigns that, Israel went, that Egypt went on into Canaan after Israel was there. Uh, in the land. It just shows us that they were still, they still had their eye on this place. Um, they were still fighting to maintain control over this land. So in short, the land of Canaan was essentially an Egyptian imperial outpost. Um, let me just go back to this slide for a moment to show you why I'm, 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 uh, I have the highlighted blue and green parts. Uh, one of the things if you look at the cities where these two military campaigns took place, they're mostly in the north, mostly in the south. Uh, archaeologically speaking, from what we can tell about the emergence of early Israel in the land, it was mostly the green zone there in the middle. And, and Lawson Stone, a, a biblical scholar and, and historian, he, he pointed out that what Israel was essentially doing is creating two buffer zones um, through their military battles to the north and the south, in between which they settled. Uh, and what they were doing was essentially breaking the, the Egyptian hold on the land uh, in order to then peaceably settle. So keeping that context in mind, if we look at Joshua, it's remarkable how the battle reports given to us are against walled cities. Um, and so... Let me see if I, yeah, I've got a picture here, so you can see um, this. Um, and to the north and south, where Egyptian power was most, most concentrated. The earliest settlements uh, were in that middle zone that I mentioned. So it seems that most of the battles were A, they were defensive, and B, 
they were against the Egyptian-backed Canaanite kings. And um, you can, I have a picture here of a middle bronze walled city, uh, uh, city wall here. So you can see the guy standing, uh, standing by it to get a sense of the scale of these old middle bronze walls. Now, Israel went in in the late bronze period, but when they went in, it's very, very likely that a lot of these old middle bronze walls were still in use. And so it gives you a sense of, of what they were dealing with um, as they went into the land were these giant sort of Egyptian-backed uh, Canaanite cities, some of them sort of remnants of an older era um, that they were uh, confronting. So uh, Israel also didn't go to battle against unwalled cities and little village settlements and so on. So it was, it was primarily that um, these Egyptian-backed cities. So as I argue in the book, the conquest seen against this backdrop was a continuation of the Exodus. It was Exodus 2.0. So while reading these wars uh, in primarily defensive terms doesn't erase the violence in the book. It sets the book's military action in a, a different anti-imperial light. So combining these insights with um, uh, some of the things I've mentioned so far in an alliterative way, um, Joshua presents Israel proceeding into the land in a way that foregrounds Israel confronting Canaanite weapons like the, um, the bronze that they had, the chariots, the horses, um, Canaanite war uh, lordism, wealth, and walled cities with the weakness of circumcision, meditation on the word, and worship. So I've, I've touched on a few examples here of the ways that Genesis and Joshua repay close reading and, and attention, uh, historical sensitivity, with questions of violence in view. So in my experience, reading carefully consistently surprises and reveals a text that's richer and more wonderful than um, a first reading would suggest. But that discovery process involves grappling with problems that are in many ways unresolvable. So we've, I've only touched on the flood and Joshua's story, but what about violent laws? What about violent prayers? What about prophetic texts that are violent? We, we could go on and on. What then? What about these unresolved questions? So part of what I hope my book achieves is an appreciation for the rich and nuanced stories that bear the very problems we seek to confront. So a correlate of that appreciation is a healthy suspicion toward any sort of single model approach to the problem of violence. Single model solutions can have serious hidden costs that I hope readers grapple with. So rather than the single model solution, I, I proposed a reckoning with the problem of violence as a, a wicked problem. Wicked problems aren't wicked because they're evil but because they resist resolution. It's like a, akin to an intractable problem. Unlike benign problems, um, like a math equation, which might be hard, but it's resolvable, um, wicked problems don't yield to a single strategy or method. So for instance, poverty is a wicked problem because it's complex interconnectedness to education, economics, health, geography, politics, uh, race, gender, and so on. And there's no agreement on how to define poverty in the first place. And how do you know when you've solved poverty? Right? Is it when everyone has the same income, the same standard of living, everyone has a roof over their head? How, how do you define that same education? So wicked problems are things that there's difficulty and disagreement on how to even define the problem. There is an intense complexity to the issues impinging on it. And there's also disagreement whether we could even uh, know if we solved it. So in their classic study of wicked problems, uh, Horst Riddle and Melvin uh, Weber point out that wicked problems become a moral snare when people treat a wicked problem as though it were a tame one or try to tame a wicked problem prematurely. So trying to tame a problem like violence in scripture with a single approach is like trying to resolve homelessness with essential oils. 
So as, as Keith Grintz points out, wicked problems require clumsy answers. I take great comfort in that. He's not promoting sloppy thinking. That's not his point. He means that we sometimes have to avoid the temptation of single-mode answers. Such answers, he writes, fail to generate sufficient diversity to address the complexity of the problem. To go back to the example of poverty, it's like looking at it and saying, I know what the problem is. Um, they... Uh, Poverty needs to be solved by uh, introducing a reading program, okay? So education via reading is one component of it, but it's, there are so many other factors at play, right? So in the face of wicked problems like poverty, we, we don't just throw up our hands, though, and say, well, there's no use trying to, um, no use trying to address it if we can't resolve it. The choice isn't between a tight solution or resigning ourselves entirely. Instead, we need to wrestle through the problem um, in its complexity. I think in a similar way with the problem of violence in the Bible, we have to treat it as a wicked problem for which there's no agreement on the problem itself. There's no obvious resolution um, and there's no agreement on the basis for what constitutes a resolution. Now, that might sound like I'm, I'm promoting hopelessness here. Um, however, I think there are gains to be made besides fully resolving the question of violence in the Bible. So perhaps we might s discover that the Bible's violent stories aren't as straightforwardly violent as we previously thought. And I hope, hope you've seen some of that here with the stories we've looked at. Or perhaps we find companions who share our concerns with the Bible, but pursue a hopeful and faithful perspective, that there is a way of holding the tensions of our faith without um, giving up on our faith. Perhaps we shed a simplistic kind of faith that lacks the resilience needed to navigate a complex world. Or perhaps we find that the stories like the flood and conquest hold more good news than we ever imagined. So my invitation is to abandon the hunt for that single strategy to the problem of violence and enter the real world of Scripture. Um, and let's lay down um, some of those uh, uh, simplistic models because Scripture has so much more to offer, right? It's not just because, the, uh, unfortunately, we can't solve it. That, that Scripture is rich and wonderful. Um, and Scripture has good news, especially in those places that we maybe don't expect it. So if such old stories, and this is something that really gives me hope, and I want to end on this. These are stories that were part of the formative curriculum of Jesus, right? And, and there's something about the Old Testament. That's the only Bible he had. Something about that, and, and he was immersed in it from an early age. It formed him so deeply, such that he taught and lived as he did. And so I think we can also invest confidence in <clears throat> the Old Testament um, as a whole, as a formative curriculum in the church, in leading us towards a kind of shalom or peace engendering vision that Jesus embraced and taught in his ministry. So with that, I'll close things. So thanks for uh, your time. <clears throat> Check. Oh, there I am. Thank you so much for sharing uh, that, Matt. I'm looking forward to the question and, and response as we can dig into what you've said, and we can wrestle with that a bit. Um, we're going to take a, uh, let's, I mean, let me check what the, time, what the time is here. We're going to take a 15-minute break, actually a 16-minute break to be more exact. A 16-minute break. We're going to come back 8, tw eight, eight, eight tw 20. If we could have just on screen uh, the slide with... The phone number on it, Fan, uh, there we go. Uh, there is a phone number there. Uh, any questions that you have on the Old Testament and violence on what Matt has spoken, uh, send a text in, and then, uh, doc, and then D Douglas and, 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 and Eric um, and Matt Lynch will be on stage. 
and we're going to have a conversation around those. So uh, there's goodies at the back. If you're online, we want you to participate in this as well. Uh, and you can send in questions and we'll get to as many as we can. Okay, see you back at 8.20. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. Chosen me. 
Check, check. <laughs> Hello, everyone. We want to welcome you in from the foyer. You are more than welcome to bring in your coffee, and you can load up your plate with some delicious treats. Uh, that is totally welcome in here. If you're online, we want to welcome you back as well, and you, you had a little break there. It's been great to see the questions starting to roll in. Just a reminder, if you haven't sent in yours yet, uh, to do so now to the number on the screen. Uh, and we're going to have some dialogue up on stage about that. Well, at this time, I'm going to invite up Douglas and Hen Herring. And I'm going to invite up Matthew Lynch, who I think might still be stuffing his face with treats out there. Oh, no, you're right there. You're right there. Bring your treats up. That's fine. That, 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 that's fine. I'm going to move this out of the way here. I can take the water. I have water here. It's good food. Excellent. I want to welcome you, if you're still in the foyer, to come find your seat. Oh. There's been some excellent questions that have cut come in and I, I think really reflect some of the wrestle that we have and maybe some, some of the challenge in, uh, on both sides of how we approach this. Mm -hmm. And the mic is just behind you there, Doug. Yeah. So, Doug, people may not be familiar with who you are. Um, just maybe give a 30-second to one-minute introduction to yourself. Thanks. I need someone to help me with tech. Uh, who am I? Oh, um, well... I'm the husband of Debbie, who's over here, and the father of two children and grand grandfather of two grandchildren. Um, I uh, taught for over 30 years uh, at the King's University. I taught theology, um, and at the King's University, it's an undergraduate institution, so that means that I taught a whole spectrum of theological topics, some of which I wasn't all that deeply informed on, but nevertheless, you have to do that. Um, but uh, certainly one of the things that has engaged me over the years is questions of um, Christian political involvement, questions of um, war and peace, questions of violence, and so on and so forth. And so I've done quite a bit of writing on those issues, mostly via the Apostle Paul, so I've written quite a bit on Paul, but um, not so much as a Paul scholar, but as a theologian who's interested in what the Apostle Paul um, has to say about a, a number of these issues. And um, uh, also, I, I wrote on First and Second Peter, and First Peter also addresses these issues. So I come at these issues more from uh, New Testament texts than Old Testament. But that's one of the reasons why we were particularly, or I was particularly excited to engage um, Matt Lynch's book on the Old Testament and some of the things that, some of the perspectives that he has uh, been able to share with us. Thank you so much, Doug. I've enjoyed the challenge and the conversation. There's something about having an ex-professor in your congregation that makes you preach just a little bit deeper. <laughs> and to not be sloppy with your Greek and your Hebrew, because you know you might get called. There's a few people at our church who know their Hebrew. Greek. You can be as sloppy with Hebrew as you want with me, because <laughs> yeah. I, I don't read Hebrew. <laughs> That's true. Well, I've got to be careful with my Greek. There's a few others in our church, too, who have called me to account on, on, a, on a few times. So, first question here. It has become popular today, and this actually, there's a few questions, so I'm going to kind of wrap them into this one, because I think this kind of touches on a bunch of them. It has become popular today to seem to sit in judgment over God and then, and then s s s separate the God of the Old Testament from the Christ of the New Testament. What do you say to that? 
Yeah, great, great question. Am I on here? Okay. Um, but sorry, real quick on the um, calling to account for Hebrew and Greek. Uh, when my wife and I were in Israel for a couple months, a uh, number of years ago, we were at a church where the pastor would be preaching and someone, like, the, the dynamic in the congregation was such that someone in the back would be like, actually, that Hebrew word can be translated this way, and they're like, in the middle of the sermon. No. So, yeah, <laughs> it's very uh, humbling. Yeah. So, uh, yes, there, the, the temptation and tendency, one temptation is to solve or resolve the problem of violence by saying, that's Old Testament stuff, and things are just different now in Jesus. And one of the problems with that uh, is to dissociate uh, Jesus from the very story in which the New Testament embeds him, which reaches back into the Old Testament. So the problem with trying to just keep that all stuff all that stuff contained in the Old Testament is that so much of the Old Testament is on the, war, on the lips of Jesus and uh, is quoted in the New Testament and is alluded to and is echoed. And so you can't, if you start pulling away the Old Testament, all the threads come out of the New Testament as well. In fact, there was an early church heretic, some of you may have heard of, Marcion, um, who, who tried to do that because among other things, of the problem of divine wrath in the Old Testament. So he, <clears throat> he proposed cutting out the Old Testament entirely for the church. He had a number of followers and even churches that he planted. And, uh, but he, by doing that, he also had to cut out most of the New Testament, ended up with a few letters of Paul and the Gospel of Luke, and the rest of it he, he got rid of. So, um, so yeah, there's... I think the New Testament is insistent that the God revealed in Christ is Yahweh of the Old Testament. And a core Christian theological conviction is that anytime you read the name Yahweh in the Old Testament, or the Lord, you know, all caps, Lord in our Bibles, um, you're referring to the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so Jesus is all over the Old Testament in that, in that sense. Uh, that doesn't resolve all the challenges, but I think it's a, it's a conviction that the church has maintained historically from the beginning and, and should be, any attempt to divide them should be fiercely resisted. Um, and then the standing in judgment over God. Remind me of that part of the question. Yeah, I'll go back to it. I'd queued up my next one for you. Um, so to sit in judgment o over God. The thing that we know better or right. that our, yeah. our morality is now a superior. Right. Uh, so I, a couple of things I'll say on that. Sometimes someone will raise a question like, that doesn't seem fair about what, a story we read in the Old Testament or that seems unjust. I don't think that's standing in judgment over God. Right. So there is a form of critique or questioning that, it, that I don't think is standing over God, uh, because the Old Testament itself shows people doing that. Uh, we have a number of psalms that do it, that plead for God to act justly, and, and even accuse God of, of doing things that don't seem fair. So there's that tradition in Scripture itself that invites us to bring those honest questions to God, and so we have permission from the Bible itself to do that, and even written prayers given to us in the church uh, in order to voice those things to God. And we see it witnessed also modeled in characters in the, in the Old Testament, Moses and Abraham and others. Um, we were talking this morning, I mentioned the text where Abraham says, will not the judge of all the earth act justly? So I don't think questioning is standing in judgment, but there is a posture where we approach the text and just say, um, in, a, in a more fundamental way, that these things are just to be resisted in the text. So there's a form of critique where it goes a step further and says, Joshua is genocidal, and therefore we should just resist this text. It's, it's purely a negative example, if anything. Uh, it's humans projecting onto God the, 
violent fantasies that they have, and, and so we, we can resist that. So I think that, that lacks maybe the posture of humility that should characterize our relationship with God, but that humility doesn't mean we never question things. So I think I want to avoid that implication as well. Tim, can I just uh, jump in for a minute with regard That's to... why you're up here. <laughs> Sorry? That's why you're up here. Okay. You can jump in. Um, with regard to the question of um, the relationship between the Testaments, the, the Old and New Testament, um, and the coming of Christ, and it, uh, I think you're right that uh, Christ is embedded in and uh, formed by the scriptures of Israel. Um, and yet, there's not a kind of simple continuity between the, the stories of the Old Testament, or, or even, shall we say, the overarching narrative of the Old Testament and the coming of Jesus. There is, I mean, Jesus, I think, himself posits a discontinuity, and I, I, see, a, I see Paul emphasizing some of the discontinuity. So, does the coming of Christ require that we go back to the Old Testament and look for patterns that perhaps weren't visible there before the coming of Christ, and to, to see something different and to emphasize some things rather than other things. Um, I, I guess that's just my yeah. question. Where, where's, it's not a straightforward continuity from the Old Testament yeah. to the New Testament. Yeah, there, there are different kinds of discontinuity in Scripture. Uh, there's a, uh, an Old Testament scholar named Walter Moberly, and he talks about the book of Genesis, and he calls Genesis the Old Testament of the Old Testament. And part of his point is that the, the sort of jump from Genesis to the rest of the Old Testament is as big as the jump from the Old to the New Testament. So there are parts of Scripture where something radically different has happened and something new has taken place that, that rearranges our conceptual framework. Um, there's a, a really... Uh, apologies for this phrase because it's very clunky. But it, I find it helpful. So um, one of my former professors, he talked about retrospective prospectivity, which is that... That the, sounds like a seminary term. I know, I know. <laughs> That's why I... I but I, I, I like what it gets at. So namely, because we've met Jesus, it forces us to go back to the Old Testament and with it look forward to the ways that it leads to Jesus. So retrospective, looking forward. And, and I like that because it's not just that the New Testament sort of reinterprets the Old. I don't think that's what's happening. But it forces us to go back to the Old Testament, and then we look forward and see, oh my goodness, this was there all along. That, um, you know, like Jesus, even on the Emmaus Road, he says to the disciples with him, like, you should have known that, didn't you know that the Messiah must suffer? And you look at it, and it's like, no, I wouldn't necessarily get that from the Old Testament, but you go back having met Jesus, and you see it then. So that's how I think about the continuity. And, and so I will, I acknowledge that my reading of Joshua is deeply informed by the fact that I've met Jesus. And that makes me go back and say, how is it, to go back to the point I landed on, how is it that these stories could be so formative in his, his life, and yet and he taught how he taught and lived how he lived. Like, is there any, anything in these stories that leads to someone like Jesus? And it's not that we can just look at any individual text and say, this points directly to Jesus, but the whole, I think, does. Thanks. Yeah. We have a lot of questions, so I'm going to now right. apologize. Right. Oh, no, it's okay. We're not going to get to them all. Um, but there's a few questions that I'm going to consolidate here. Um, how do we understand um, those who would use the Joshua conquest story as prescriptive and apply it to the modern day context? Examples would be the Afrikaners who called the uh, who called the uh, the Africans the the, the the Canaanites and they were the Israelites. This was used in the conquest of the Americas as well, and is currently being used in. Israel's war against Gaza and 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 Hamas. Yeah. 
So how do we, yeah? Well, I think um, there are a couple angles on that. I think one is that what happens in the book of Joshua is, is explicitly time bound. Um, so however you read that story, it was a unique thing that was to happen at the conquest. And by the time you even get to the book of Judges, the, the writer has told us that, that God was no longer going to remove the Canaanites from the land. They were going to remain there and be a sort of thorn in the side of Israel. So it's so already in Judges, like, the possibility of what Deuteronomy had envisioned was gone. So, so there's that. There's also the fact that this is limited to the seven Canaanite nations, and those are all no longer there anymore. Um, and then within the Old Testament itself, we see people reading the laws of Deuteronomy 7, which is, and I keep referring to those because that's where the law to wipe them out entirely is given. Um, we see kings in the Old Testament reinterpreting those laws in reference specifically to the destruction of Canaanite idols and worship places, but not actual people. So um, to then apply it to a people group in the modern context is just violating so many parts of the way that the Old Testament had already modified that possibility. Um, and then uh, yeah, there are so many other issues. As a Christian, to assume that biblical Israel is simplistically to be equated with the modern state of Israel, I think, needs serious questioning. Um, and then finally, uh, I'll, I'll mention something a uh, Palestinian Christian pointed out to me. Um, because he wrote a, a book called From Land to Lands, and, and it's about reading the Old Testament land promises as a Palestinian Christian, which is a, a very interesting question. He's, he's asking, how is it that these land promises to Israel, what do they mean to me as a Palestinian? And one of the texts he pointed out is Ezekiel 47, 22, where the prophet talks about the future day when God would restore the land of Israel. And it says that when the people apportion the land to the Israelites, they're to tr give land to the non-Israelite and treat them as the native born. And it says like they are to be just as you uh, in this land. So even if you make some link between the land of Israel today and biblical Israel, which I would want to question, um, or at least have a conversation about, uh, the, the future land ideal within the Old Testament is one where, where there's a place for the non-Israelites and not their extermination or removal. And so that's, I think, an important caveat too. Thank you for that. Doug, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, it, it would be running down a different track. Okay. Well, we got lots of questions, so. Well, okay, so, you, no, you go there, you've got something. So certainly from the talk you heard today, um, you see that Matthew, I think, has really complexified the story of Joshua. Um, and actually com complexified, if you read the book, complexified other stories. Um, and that's based on a lot of scholarly research, um, paying careful attention to details within the text of Joshua itself paying very careful attention to, you could say, almost conflicting stories within, or conflicting narratives within the single book of Joshua, um, to, as, as one person in our study group said, aren't you just trying to minimize um, what kind of sticks out <laughs> as uh, the problem with the book of Joshua? So, and uh, I mean, I, that's not my view, but I know that this question has been raised. Are you, are you not just trying to, um, maybe I could just say, deconstruct the text of Joshua so that it doesn't have the same impact that we typically think it has? Yeah, uh, interesting question. I, I think, um, I don't think so. I'm trying, what I'm trying to do is account for 
the way that the story itself is, is told in the book. And that, that story involves certain tensions within it that I don't think deconstruct, but need to be considered synoptically, like just like the synoptic gospels. You don't want to collapse Matthew and Luke and John and, and Mark into each other. Um, they each have their voice where to listen to. So what I'm trying to do with Joshua is listen to the different voices in that story, but also think about what are they doing together in concert. Um, and I could unpack that more, but that's how I would say that. For well, that one thing I appreciate from our conversation uh, in our morning together, and you didn't touch on this so much here, but you did a bit, was how I was often taught that Joshua is about the judgment of those in the land they're going into that they're wiping out. Mm -hmm. But the book of Joshua is as much an indictment on the Israelites. Yeah. Like it's, as, it, it's, it's calling out the idolatry in their own hearts. Yeah. It's calling out their lust of, of wealth. Mm -hmm. It's calling out their idolatry to these gods that are, are, are surrounding them. And to me, that was really eye-opening because I'd always heard of, well, they're going in and these people deserve it anyways. And, et cetera, et cetera. And I would disagree with some of those, those viewpoints, but I appreciated how you did that. There's a, there's a question here, and there's lots, but I think this one would be helpful. What is the problem with seeing these stories of extreme violence as parables, as symbols, as, as, mem as mem metaphors, as people not hearing God right, such as Pete Enns would say, rather than literal events? Yeah, so uh, Pete Enns would posit a greater degree of discontinuity than, than I would. Um, so I think in reading any text, like I think a fundamental question is what, what are the intentions of the writers of this story? Um, are they meaning for us to read it as a parable? So I, I do think something like that is the case for the flood story in a way that is not the case for the book of Joshua. Um, but I don't think you can just take Joshua and say it gives us a sort of drone camera footage of events that took place in the 1200 BC era. Um, it is more layered than that and, and a little more complicated, so I, I'm not wanting to be historically naive about it. One of the problems with, with saying, though, that the book is just giving us people's misunderstandings of God is that I, th I think that that sort of undermines the revelatory value of these texts um, and more generally the Old Testament. Uh, Greg Boyd argues something similar that essentially people misrepresented God and if there's any revelatory value in the Old Testament violent text, it's that God allows himself to be misrepresented. That's the the sort of takeaway from that. Um, and I use an analogy in the book of like a story that I, I read someone use to talk about this issue. And he said, so he had a neighbor, this really happened to him, where he had a grease stain in his garage on the, on the floor. And so he poured gasoline on it and, uh, and, and scrubbed it until he got rid of the stain entirely. And then he closed his garage door. And meanwhile, the pilot light on, the, on his uh, furnace was on in there. And once the fumes filled the garage, the whole thing blew up and his house burned down. And uh, so he, he, talks, he, was, he was making the point that sometimes like, we have to be careful or at least read the fine print when we adopt a solution to a problem. Like, Saying that the story is of just a misunderstanding of God is, I think, maybe it's too hard on Pete Enns, but I think it's like removing the stain with, with gasoline. It gets rid of it, uh, but it comes potentially at a very high cost in terms of um, the revelatory value of, of the Old Testament. And that's, that's a pretty core Christian conviction that this, this tells us something uh, about God and who he, who he is. Now, I think we have to think through that carefully, but yeah, those are a few thoughts on that. Thank you, Doug. Is it possible to think of the flood story and uh, 
the book of Joshua and, and many, many of the historical books in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. is it possible to think of them as a kind of extended proclamation hmm. to, uh, in, in, and so in a proclamation you aren't overly worried about all the careful historical details, even though you're not, as it were, leaving history behind. Yeah. But it's, it's a proclamation to a people in a particular time um, that is making certain emphases and making certain points. I mean, obviously, you, you, let's face it, the book of Joshua would be a long sermon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but, uh, but it, would, would, you, would it be helpful to think of it as, uh, as the, the, his, uh, the historical books as extended sermons? I, I think so. Like in the Jewish way of framing the books, it's, they're called the former prophets, which is weird to us because it's like, no, the prophets is like Isaiah and Ezekiel and all that stuff. But they, what they meant was that the Israelite understanding of history is that it's prophetically driven. In other words, God speaks to his people and that's what moves history along through prophetic figures um, like we see appearing at various points in the story. Um, so I, I, think, I think it's right that the primary purpose of these stories is not to give us history. That's not their aim. And I talk in the book a little bit about, like, it's very likely that the final form of the book, as we have it, didn't even come together until uh, Israel was in exile or perhaps even later. That doesn't mean there aren't details that go back earlier, but it was written for a people who were not trying to figure out how to get rid of Canaanites. That's not their driving aim, and that's, that's, not, such a good point. that's not the author's aim. They were trying to ask questions about what fidelity to Yahweh looks like um, for, for them in their day. Just like we read Joshua, and our problem is not how to get rid of Canaanites. It's not what we're trying to solve. Um, what, a, what, a, yeah. what, 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 Cockroaches, is, is, does yeah. it have anything in there for that? <laughs> yeah, that might be an issue too. Yeah. Uh, but that's sure. not the question. Yeah, yeah. We, ha we have to ask what is the question the text is answering? Yeah, exactly. And so I think that is very important to keep in mind that like this book is not to be used that way. And, right. and so to go back to the Israel context today, it's not what the book's designed for. So it's not, not very helpful toward that end. Well, I think it's, it's helpful to use that framework, too, because you'll read a, a, par, a, portion in, a portion in Judges, and you'll be able to tell me where exactly this is, but I remember it says, and, it, and they wiped them all out. And then two chapters, you read on, and, yeah. oh, there's people there. Yeah. I thought it said to wipe them all out. Yeah. You know, like, so which is it? Are there people there, or are they all wiped out? And you're, okay, no, this isn't written with yeah. the lens to give an exact historical, there's a proclamation element yeah. here of declaring who Yahweh is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Question here. It seems like the two exact, and if you're sending a question and it sounds like yours, but there's a different part to it, it's because I'm putting questions together. Uh, so it, you might have heard one of your questions. You go, oh, well, there's a different part, but there's because I'm putting questions together that are, that, are, 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 that are similar. It seems like two examples of flood and fury are representing violence as redemptive. Are there, are there, instances of God approved violence in the Bible that isn't redemptive. Does the Bible make a distinction between the violence of God and the violence of the people in the Old Testament? Yeah, good, good questions. Um, I'm hard pressed to find examples of God ordained violence that's not redemptive. Um, I, I guess you could say there are instances where it just in the story it seems punitive, um, but if sort of maybe if you pan out, you see that it is meant to kind of restore something in the community more broadly. Um, but yeah, I do think, we talked about this a little bit this morning, I do think there's a difference between what God's allowed to do and what humans are permitted to do. And I know there's going to be differing views on that, but um, so caveats aside, and, and Doug, you know, feel free to jump in on this. But there is a, a, a tradition, in, for instance, in the Bible of vengeance is God's and not ours. Um, and so while there might be violent prayers in the Psalms, that's a way of putting it in God's hands and God can do what God wants with that prayer. Um, we don't take vengeance for ourselves and that's, that's a key point. Um, 
And, and so I think that, that that hints at the, this larger reality that, that God can act in ways that maybe we're not to imitate. Um, a friend of mine, he wrote in a book called This Strange and Sacred Scripture, which I definitely recommend. Um, he, he has a section in it, When Not to Be Like God. And it's precisely on this point that not everything God does were to imitate directly. Hmm. Interesting. Doug, thoughts on that? I think I think God is God. <laughs> so yeah. I, I I mean, in your book, you talk about uh, the various strategies uh, for dealing with violence in the Old Testament and um, and Augustine's divine command theory, uh, in which effectively Augustine and I think Calvin after him uh, basically says um, God has. God is sovereign will, and therefore God has the authority um, to uh, do as he wills and command as he wills um, without being answerable to our sensibilities, if you want to put it that way. Um, I, I don't go that far, but I, but I, I, do, think, I do think that um, a text like Joshua does encourage us to at least understand that we aren't God. <laughs> and, and that, um, I, I mean, it's, even, even reading Matt's book uh, and deeply appreciating um, uh, all that he's done there, I, I still find reading the book of Joshua just a deeply humbling experience. And, and I, think, I think this is your aim. <laughs> Mm -hmm. to, to humble us before this text, um, I, I love what you do and you say, look, you, you should fix your attention elsewhere than on the simple conquest narratives, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Fix your ten attention on chapters 1 to 5. Fix your attention on the later chapters of, of uh, Joshua to see that it isn't all about one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's very helpful. And, and yet at the same time, I read a text like Joshua and, and many, many texts. I mean, I read... I read the Gospels, and you think, these, these are humbling texts. I'm standing here before, uh, I'm standing here before a mystery, and I, 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 I think mystery is often a cop-out, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I am standing here before a mystery that, as your last chapter mm -hmm. states, is irresolvable at, in, in some ways. We, we can't put all the pieces together into a nifty puzzle and say, there it is. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, so there is that, um, there's that aspect of humility, which I, which I saw coming out in your book over and over, um, despite the fact that you really want to pay careful attention to a whole variety of dimensions and to make it genuinely complex. But I, but I do see this sense of humbling yourself in the end, before the God of the yeah. text. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very much so. Well, and you pull out in your book, and, and this came out in our, our, our morning conversation too, about, and I'd love for you maybe just to, just to expound on this just a little bit more, how these texts actually show how the mercy of God mm -hmm. is so much bigger than the judgment of God. Yeah, so in the... At the, toward the end of the book, I, I, I want to pan out a little bit from the problem of violence uh, and, and ask a question about God's character, because I think behind the question of violence in the Bible is often that deeper question of, like, is God good? And is, God's, is the depiction of God in the Bible one of a God who is good? And, and I, love, I love Tertullian's response to Marcion, who, who cut out the Old Testament, where he says to... Marcion, uh, the God, you want a God who is simplistically good. And God is good, but he's not simplistically good. And, and so there's a, there's a deep complexity to his goodness. And I think, so when I, when I was panning out, I wanted to like think through that question a little more, having looked at the problem of violence. And, and I said that when we're thinking about God's character, the Old Testament actually does a good job of summarizing 
at the end of the day, what is God like? And it's found in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, where it talks about the, the Lord, the Lord, a God gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, um, forgiving iniquity and sin, yet not leaving the guilty unpunished, punishing children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, um, oh, and showing steadfast love to thousands. So that formulation holds together the mercy and judgment of God that you can't let them separate from each other. And that might be our tendency um, to, to let them sort of spin apart. But it also doesn't say that mercy and judgment are sort of co-equal qualities in God's character because his mercy is to thousands of generations, um, whereas his judgment is to the third and fourth. And I don't think the precise math is the point, but the disproportion is the point that his mercy is super abundant um, in a way that sort of exceeds our imagination. Uh, yet he also is a God who brings judgment. So, so that's what I mean about his character being imbalanced in a good way, toward, tilted toward mercy, but never in a way that we could just sort of shove all the judgment to the side. And that text, by the way, it's quoted uh, uh, 13 or 14 times in the Old Testament itself. So it, 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 uh, the Old Testament recognizes the priority of that claim about God. And pieces of that declaration are throughout the Old Testament as well. Yeah. Now, this is kind of going back to uh, the second part of the question, two questions ago that we didn't touch on. Does, does the Old Testament in the language it uses, does it, does it to differentiate between the violence of mankind and the mm -hmm. violence of God? Yeah, so the word violence or to shed blood, those are the two main ways of describing bad violence, <laughs> um, are hardly ever attributed to God. If they are, it's by... Um, Job, who accuses God of violence, and at one point the prophet Ezekiel does, and Ezekiel is a bit of a wild card. Um, <laughs> That's putting it lightly. Yeah. Yes. He's, uh, he does a lot of revisionary interesting things, but th the point is that the Old Testament actually resists associating violence with God, um, not because God never does anything like warfare or things that we see as violent, but because the term violence or shedding blood um, implies a, a morally unjustified act. And so I think it, so the Old Testament, first of all, recognizes that humans do things that God doesn't, um, namely like immoral things. Um, and then conversely, like I was saying about vengeance, there are certain judicial operations that are only God's domain and not our domain. And so, like, the, the taking of personal vengeance, of, of evening a score, is, is, is taken from us. Um, and it's only in God's hand, hands. Doug, do you have some thoughts there on that? I've got some thoughts, but I'm going to yeah, defer to um, you. <laughs> no, you go ahead. Uh, I, I was, I was yeah. going to ask Matt then why he is not a pacifist, but we, we, yes, don't, get, yes. we, we don't want to get into that. Um, I, think, I think we should... Uh, well, he's surrounded. He's got, he's got an Anabaptist on both sides yeah, of him here. Yeah, I don't know. Or, yeah. or somebody who'd be... A, maybe not. Or, a, or who's a pacifist? He's got a pacifist. Feeling threatened. Yeah. By pacifists. You're in danger of bodily harm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I guess that, that's the one thing I'm wrestling with because um, as an person who comes from a Mennonite Brethren perspective yeah. that I would hold, which is what this church is for those who maybe have come and aren't quite sure what, what, like what we are. Yeah. Um, um, one of the, the, the perspectives is, is we read all scripture through the lens of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So Jesus becomes this, this primary lens with which we look back and yeah. which we understand these Old Testament texts, right? And I like what you said. It, it makes us look back and then look forward. And so as you shared that about these two words for violence, I would say, uh, 
then how does, because Jesus seems to take then even a, a different stance on violence, because he used the phrase like, we shouldn't do what God does, but then in Jesus we have the example of what we should do. Right, yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah. so there's that, there's that bit of that wrestle there. Yeah, I mean, even in the Old Testament, there's be holy as I am holy. To imitation of God is not like off limits in the Old Testament. It's yeah. to be pursued. Um, so I think, yeah, why I'm not a pacifist, that there's... Uh, that's not what I asked you, okay. but, but you yeah. can answer and that. To out where <laughs> and the fact is, uh, your statement. You know, yeah. the, the, yeah. we're just trying to trap you and yeah, make you the, say the, something. The language yeah. of pacifism itself is a, a, a bit there's a, there's other difficult. Issues. Nonviolent yeah. activists. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there you go. But 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 the question does uh, so, so even with the question of judgment and mercy or justice and mercy, yeah. when you get to the conclusion of Paul's extended and rather difficult argument in Romans at the end of chapter 11, it does seem that things get resolved into mercy. Yeah, yeah. And then Paul in chapter 12 says, and now we live out of the mercies of God. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so it isn't just, it isn't just Jesus' teachings. Um, we, we also see that uh, whatever sin and death have done to humankind, uh, let's say in Romans 5, um, gets super abundantly undone yeah. in Jesus Christ. So, so and, and that picking up on, on the, the core text of the Old Testament where there's a super abundance of mercy. Yeah. So, uh, so to live out of the mercies of God, I, 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 this is what, the way I'd rather put it, to live out of the mercies of God uh, is not pacifism, but it's a, it's, it's a different embodiment. It's, it's, it's embodying a different kind of, well, it's embodying yeah. that single aspect of God, if you want to put yeah. it that way. Yeah, I, I don't know if this is going to, like, I, I don't think this will be satisfactory in response to that, but I do think, like, living out of the mercy of God and as a community pointing toward a different kingdom and living toward a different reality is a sort of, like, forward-facing eschatological claim like, like we are we're going to embody in this community this church community the world that is to come in other words the shalom of god is going to eventually be c characterize all creation and we're going to live into that now um and i think i guess for me like my resistance to pacifism put it that way um as comes, long as it's not violent yeah comes from we are we do live between the times and so some of our work unfortunately is is dealing not just with pointing toward the world to come but dealing with the brokenness of the world that is and as i put it this morning i think insofar as we would participate in condone or whatever any act of violence that that's not like a good that the church does or that Christians would do. That's something that if we do any of that, that that's to be, that also needs atoning and dealing with. That, that sometimes our choices in dealing with the brokenness of the world are between really bad and really evil. And those are our options rather than good and evil. And when presented with really bad and really evil and we choose the really bad that needs dealing with um, because we are you know participating in something that's that's is dying and is broken and is gonna fade away um, and the church needs the pacifist witness to point toward the world to come so I I I, I don't try to convince pacifists to not be pacifists um, I think that's important, and maybe I'll be convinced otherwise, too. So. Well, thank you. Uh, it's been a robust conversation, and I appreciate the dialogue that we've had here. It's uh, now 9.03, so we're going to wrap it up. Um, thank you so much, Matt, for the way you fielded questions. You've sat in the hot seat, oh, and I've appreciated your willingness. Thank you, Doug, for yeah. also being willing to share, and for everyone who texted in your questions. I know we didn't get to them all.
but thank you for participating and for sending them in. Can we get Doug and Matt a hand and just oh, thank nice. them for the way that they've served us here. We, uh, Matt will be speaking here tomorrow morning uh, on uh, talking about the flood more in depth. So if you are interested in that, we invite you to come. I uh, want to thank you for being here this evening. As a church, we want to be a church that uh, gives space for these conversations and thinks through these things. And so um, if you have questions about Christ, maybe you came and you're wrestling with questions of faith. I know that either one of us would love to chat to you and to hear your story and to field your questions. So I'm just going to pray a prayer of blessing. God, I thank you that your word is rich, that it is beautiful, and it is challenging and strange. And all of these are in there. Lord, I thank you that it's not always just easily crackable by one code, but we need to dig, we need to think, we need to sit with the text. We need to listen to one another. We need the community of faith to help guide us as we interpret the text. God, I thank you that your scripture points to you, the ultimate word of God, the person of Christ through whom all of scripture is read. And so, God, I thank you that you have revealed yourself in the person of Christ and that you have called us to live in the kingdom of God. And Lord, I pray that as we go from here, Lord, as we go to churches tomorrow morning around the city, Lord, as we gather in worship with brothers and sisters in Christ, as maybe we wrestle with these thoughts more, would you guide us through your spirit? God, we thank you that you are building your church, that you are building your, your kingdom, and nothing will stop it. In your name, amen. 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 Go in peace. Thanks.